This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Zero. Atlanta, Denver, Houston, Los Angeles, New York City, San Francisco, Seattle. This May, the Zero Roadshow is coming to a city near you. As an accountant, when you join Zero, you'll not only have access to essential practice management tools, but you'll be joining a collaborative community of accountants and bookkeepers. At the Zero Roadshow, you'll meet this community, learn how your practice can benefit from the full power of the Zero platform, and even earn CPE credit. To register for free to the Zero Roadshow USA 2019 event nearest you, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.com slash Zero Roadshow. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.com forward slash X-E-R-O. R-O-A-D-S-H-O-W. If you can't make any of the live roadshow events, be sure to sign up for one of the free online roadshow events in June. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. David, are you safely back from New Orleans? I am. I just saw you. We were hanging out in New Orleans for three days, right? Yeah, I feel like I didn't get to spend much time with you, though. You were so busy running the conference. Yeah. And now we're doing, I think, the fifth hour of recording of the podcast this week Yeah, (laughs) because we did four hours of interviews at the accounting salon on Monday. That was awesome. So great to see so many of our friends and colleagues and new people. And we'll be sharing out those interviews as bonus episodes over the next month or so. And you got your beignets while you were there? I did get my beignets. I got got to eat two of them. You got your Bourbon Street on? I got my Bourbon Street on briefly. (laughs) <laughs> we did a ghost tour, which is kind of interesting. Yes, the ghost tour. That was um, kind of creepy. I do like how it was all tied back into Nicolas Cage. The IRS got involved in the ghost tour because they repossessed one of Nicolas Cage's haunted houses or something. So I just thought that was funny that a bunch of accounts are on a ghost tour and it ties back into the IRS. And I love it. Any news this week? <laughs> well, believe it or not, into it is not my headline this week. Oh, wait, we almost forgot to review. Oh, I have okay. a review to read. Sorry Let's, about that. I'm, I'm jumping right ahead. No worries. So we'll, we'll scratch the news. We have more important things. All right. I'm going to read this review. It is from the UK. Unfortunately, I do not have the name. Okay. Informative and entertaining, but it's only four stars. Well, what can we do to be better? Let's find out. As a UK-based accountant and software advisor, I am limited as to the resources of information on fintech and specifically cloud accounting tech. This is parentheses. We really need a podcast over here. I benefit greatly from the insights on this podcast and find it as a way to find the way it is delivered entertaining. I encourage anyone new to this field or wanting to expand their knowledge to tune in and subscribe. Four stars purely as you guys don't make me laugh as much as the blokes on From the Trenches. Oh, man. And a little winky smiley face. <laughs> so I think we have to consciously be funnier now yeah. um, in order to earn that fifth star because we're entertaining, but only up to four stars. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for the review. Yes, and, uh, anonymous listener. And to all of our listeners, if you would like to give us a review on iTunes, we will read it on the air. All right. So uh, that's the reviews. So I, I think last week we started out with a joke. We were like, oh, we should read in the podcast and Tweet News of the Week. But they're not the biggest story this week. No, thankfully, Walters Kluwer, another giant tech company in the accounting world, decided to step up and become the headline story. They even made Journal of Accountancy. They were in Accounting Today, Krebs on Security. There's a whole Reddit thread about this on Monday. CCH went down completely. Walters Kluwer suffered a malware attack. And before you jump too further, uh, because I think we might have a set of listeners that are just cloud accountants that are just doing small business bookkeeping. Oh, yeah. And they might not be using any of this company's products. So, like, even myself being in this space, I'm not super familiar with what they do or why I use, why would I use one of their products? What do I use it for? Uh, simply put, tax software, especially for medium and large firms. Okay. So, Walters Kluwer suffered a malware attack. And they, according to the Journal of Accountancy, took down their applications on Monday as a preventative measure because they didn't know how how deeply the malware had gotten in, which basically meant that if you're in tax, you cannot you cannot put together tax returns. You can't use the software. You can't e-file anything. This was really freaking people out because there are deadlines coming up. There's a May 15th deadline. And uh, some people had May 7th deadlines and they couldn't they couldn't work. Right. So. Not only are you losing billable hours, but you got deadlines to worry about. And everybody's freaking out because, hey, was client information stolen in this malware attack? And everything was down from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, They got the applications back up on Thursday. 
So when you say everything was down, I think I saw some tweets like, yes, the, the platform was down, but it sounds like like their tech support phones were down. Like everything was oh, down yeah. when you say everything. Yeah, right? yeah. No, like, we have, so yeah, we haven't even talked about the uh, the PR disaster of this whole thing, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm just talking about the the actual apps, right? Yeah, um, okay. So yeah, the apps are down. Uh, people can't get in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It started coming up again for people. Uh, various firms at different times were getting access, but e-file still wasn't working. And now I'm I'm seeing on Twitter this morning, it's Friday, May 10th, and I'm seeing that e-file is now working for folks. So pretty much four days, three or four days, the, uh, firms couldn't access their... Imagine if, if, you're a, if you're a QuickBooks Online bookkeeper or accounting firm and you do most of your work in QuickBooks, imagine if QuickBooks was down for three or four days, right? This is a disaster. Major, right? Because, okay. you know, like when QuickBooks goes out for like a morning, people are freaking out, right? So I want to talk about like what happened because that is one issue. And then the second issue is the whole communications response to this thing. Because part of the reason people are freaking out is that they were not getting updates from Walters Kluwer as to what is happening. We don't know for sure, but we suspect that the malware actually not only took down the applications, but, um, uh, well, Walters Kluwer took down the applications proactively, like the customer facing stuff, but also disabled like their internal systems. So they couldn't send out emails. It was almost radio silence from Walters Kluwer. And so people were speculating on Reddit as to what happened. There's a whole th thread over in r slash uh, sysadmin as to like why CCH was down, uh, talking about uh, malware attacks and some actually some employees or people who are insiders not necessarily employees, but people who know employees were posting as to what happened and then realizing, oh, that might not be such a good idea and then deleting the comments. And well, what should we talk about first, David? Should we talk about like what happened or? The yeah, let's talk a little bit about what happened. And like when we say malware attack, is this kind of, was it something specifically directed at them or was this one of those like somebody clicked a link in an email and then because of that infected that machine and then it propagated from their virtual machines to all the other virtual machines, similar to, I think, um, Cloud Nine, I think, had that happen last summer. Yeah, maybe? so we don't know exactly how this happened, like what, how the malware got in. There is an article on Krebs on Security on Friday, May third. Krebs on Security notified Walters Kluwer that they had apparently a server online where file directories containing new versions of CCH's software were open and writable by any anonymous user. And there were suspicious files in those directories indicating some users abused that access. Shortly after that report, the CCH file directory for tax software downloads was taken offline. And then as of the publication of that blog on Krebs on Security, that's when users started reporting outages on the CCH websites and apps and all that stuff. So lack of security, right? having an open server that any anonymous user could write to that contains software updates, that is... Hey, we don't know the whole story, but that's scary. Right? That's that's a big, it's a major big, mistake. Big no, no, right? Uh, so we don't know if that's the reason, but could be right. Lack of security. And, and just to like rewind a little bit, so we talked about Facebook uh, having uh, a password file, right, open, but only Facebook employees. Yeah, that was could internal, get to it. yeah. Like, this is open to the entire world. Like if you had the know-how in the the programming chops yeah. and the code chops. You could get access to this. Anybody in the world yep. could. And, you know, there's some technical stuff they talk about in the article about how they have like PHP and text files in there. And that's just not good security. And so so that's that's a bad sign. Right. So we don't know exactly what caused the outage, uh, but we suspect it was malware got in, infected the corporate networks. And CCH was concerned that it would also potentially infect the production environment in which uh, all the applications are hosted. And here's the thing about that I'm learning about how this all works, how CCH does cloud. It's not true cloud as we think of it. It's not SaaS uh, like QuickBooks or Xero or any of the other Expensify, Gusto, any of these other tools that you access through a browser. Multi-tenant SaaS, right? yeah. So the way CCH built their cloud was they took their old desktop product Listeners, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't use the product, but it appears that they took their old desktop product and they are hosting it in a shared hosting environment for firms. And you access it through a virtual terminal. This is not what I consider. I don't know about you, David, but I don't consider this to be cloud, true cloud. This is just... No, it's just desktop hosting. Yeah, this is a hack. 
right? This is a way to make something that would normally be installed on a server in your office accessible through the cloud, but it's still installed on a server somewhere, even if it's a virtual server. And the reason this is a problem is because that's fundamentally less secure than true SaaS, true cloud software as a service. Because you've got these applications running on Windows in a server and it's shared, it's, it's, it's hosted on a shared server, that server can get infected with malware in a way that it, it's very, very difficult to do if it's a true SaaS solution. And the suspicion is also that, well, if, if the corporate network got infected, if like an employee at Walters Kluwer, if their computer got infected, if they had proper security, then it should never infect the production environment with client data. But I guess they were concerned that it might. So this is, this is the problem, right? If you, you can't, if you go cloud halfway, you still got this huge security risk. Now you're just outsourcing your risk to Walters Kluwer. Yeah, because it's the same fundamental thing. If you have an office of 100 PCs right. and somebody gets a virus and it spreads to the other 99 PCs. But it, what's crazy is like the whole point of me using desktop hosting, if I want to use that, is so I don't have to do the admin or IT work and ensure my machines are right. secure. Right. I'm, I'm just like if I, I use ADP for payroll, I'm pushing my payroll risk on right. ADP. Right. I'm theory, I'm pushing my hosting because I'm going to use a hosting provider. I'm pushing my IT risk and security risk on them. But somehow or another, like which I'm to me, I'm, I can't wrap my brain around these. These machines are infected. They're virtual machines. So it's like having 99 computers in your right. network. But. I, like I don't understand how they're not siloed out and how it gets from one machine to the other machine to the other machine. Like that is like because they're shared hosting. So you've got multiple firms on one virtual server. That's that lowers costs. To have your own is way more expensive. Yeah, I don't. I will have to go back and look at those data. But but it was it was a similar scenario where malware got on the one machine. It kind of yeah. just spread. So that's that's how this happened. So that's a big lesson, right? This this doesn't work. And Walters Kluwer. Right? This would be as if, imagine if Intuit, instead of building QuickBooks Online, had just said, oh, we'll just take QuickBooks Desktop and we'll host it for you in the cloud. And now it's cloud. Now that's QuickBooks Online. Walters Kluwert didn't make that investment in building a new product, which, you know, hopefully they'll do that now. Uh, so that's one issue. The second, and probably the, the, I don't know if it's bigger or equal, is just the lack of communication from Walters Kluwer as this was happening. And just to put this in perspective, they're, they're over a $4 billion company. In 2016, they had 4.3 billion euros in revenue, 19,000 employees. And it was almost impossible to find updates from them anywhere but on their Facebook page. They started updating their Facebook page with information about the outage, uh, very vague releases, very vague information. And I didn't actually see an official Walters Kluwer communications person quoted anywhere online until this CNBC article that was just published at 6.13 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, May 8th. So this whole thing started on Monday, Monday morning, and nobody from the company was out there t saying anything uh, in the press until Wednesday. People weren't getting emailed. They didn't know where to go to find information. It's not like CCH's customers know to go to their Facebook page to, to find information. <laughs> I just find it mind boggling that a company of this size could have such a like absent emergency response plan. Well, especially in 2019, because it's not like, like let's go back. I, I mean, I think Zero had an outage once when they were in the middle of that transition to uh, Amazon. I remember, I want to go back to 2000. Six two thousand seven and two it had a big major. They, they two in a two week period. I think had two major outages. Like one was something that would somebody did on themselves. They made a mistake and a bunch of servers had to be restarted in a bad router or something like that. And then literally two weeks later, somebody crashed a car into a, a major power transformer half a mile away from the Intuit data center in San Diego. And then that shut things down. Not communicating was a mistake companies made a decade ago. And now yeah. people should know how to handle communications about an outage. But you're right. And it's 2019 and they failed at communicating about an outage. And here's how bad it was, right? Here's, here's the lack of communication. On May 6th, uh, that was... Was that Monday? Yes, that was Monday. On May 6th, they put a statement on their Facebook page saying, on May 6th, 2019, Walters Kluwer experienced network and service interruptions affecting certain Walters Kluwer platforms and applications. Out of an abundance of caution, we proactively took offline a number of our other applications as we continue to investigate any impact. This prevented us from having adequate time to provide you advance notice, and for that, we sincerely apologize. We are working diligently around the clock to restore service as soon as possible. 
We apologize to our customers for the inconvenience and appreciate your patience. We will provide further updates as they become available. That was it. Then that was at 7 p.m. after all their apps had been out for a day. And then they did another update on May 7th in the morning saying pretty much the same thing that they have uh, begun their investigation and they're using third-party consultants to help. At this time, no indication that our customer's data has been compromised, but not much more information than that. No ETA. They did an update in the afternoon. Again, no ETA, pretty much restating the same thing. Uh, you know, It's basically one or two updates per day. And at this point, you should probably be on Twitter. You should be issuing press releases. You should be giving people an ETA, giving them, just be transparent about this, right? They, they don't even have a status page. You can't even go to uh, like like zero. For, and, and doesn't QuickBooks have a status page now where you can go to status.zero.com yep. and you can get updates or whatever it is. Pretty much everybody who knows what they're doing at this point does that, right? All the big companies anyway. So did you say any, uh, obviously accountants and bookkeepers, they, it was a problem for them. Right. They couldn't get in. Like you, you said, they, they couldn't do their work. I mean, is there any uh, client facing impacts that have happened where people have missed deadlines, things like that? I haven't I have I have not seen that, uh, but I'm sure there will be issues. I mean, just look at the uh, the firms that are on the firms that are on Walters Kluwer products are probably mostly charging by the hour. And <laughs> Imagine how many billable hours they just lost. That's the financial impact on the firms is, you know, they weren't able to work, they weren't able to bill for their time, probably a good reason to, you know, move off of hourly billing. Just setting that aside, I'm thinking, you know, Walters Kluwer's official line is that there is no evidence that client data has been impacted. That is not very reassuring to me. <laughs> saying there is, that we don't know that anything has been stolen is very different than saying everything is good, nothing was stolen. There's an article on May 6th talking about this mega cortex ransomware. The actual I think that's what people that are speculating is it. the malware that they got hit by. Yeah. And if you uh, apparently this is a I'll read a little quote on this. Um, I'll just read this paragraph here. Mega Cortex now joins an ever growing list of ransomware strains that cyber criminal groups are using only in targeted attacks rather than with spam or other mass deployment techniques. This was deliberately targeting deliberately targeting cch yes is the idea yeah and to me i'm I'm thinking well if they were able to get the malware in there isn't the whole point of the malware to either steal confidential information or ransom information so the idea that it got in there and didn't have an impact i'm very skeptical about that anyway hopefully uh elizabeth queen vice president of risk management for walters kluwer will be more forthcoming. Um, uh, and she is quoted in that CNBC article saying, we're working around the clock to restore service and we want to provide them, the accountants, the assurance that we can restore service safely. We've made very good progress so far. And reiterated a written statement saying, we have seen no evidence that customer data was taken or that there was a breach of confidentiality of that data. So, Also, there is no reason to believe that our customers have been infected through our platforms and applications. Our investigation is ongoing. So I think maybe we close it with this because I think the lesson here is this really looks to infect at a high level and then deploy down to the machines. Sophos, which is a research company, a security research company, they're recommending that all companies adopt two-factor <laughs> authentication for internal well, networks, especially your central yeah. management servers. Like, like that will help stop this. Be in, be in constant communication. That's the maddening part. That's what really gets people mad. I think that that's what really ticks people off is the non-visibility into it. Yeah, be on, be on Twitter. Have a team that's responding to every complaint saying, you know, here's the information. This is what we're doing. We apologize. Like, don't, don't let it get to the point where people are going on Reddit and just speculating. You have to, you, you got to be part of the conversation or else the conversation will happen without you. All right, so that's out of the way. Um, what else kind of happened in the news this week? Getting back to Intuit news, while we were at the accounting salon having some great conversations, something very interesting happened. Uh, Michael Lee got an email. He said he he announced that he got an email from a client. And Michael Lee, he, he runs a firm called Reconcile. We're, Michael, they were the firm of the future finalist, I think, right for Canada. I, I, I think. Well, they're not in Canada. They're in Vermont. Oh, he's Vermont. Were, okay. I mean, he, he was the U.S. firm of the future. Leader. Finalist. A Canadian, a Canadian firm won it again, but yeah. he was, yes, of the global. But yes, so he was the U.S. firm of the future winner for the U.S. Yes. So this is a firm that is, you know, 
one of Intuit's uh, example firms, right? A hi- uh, highlight this firm to everybody else. This is what you should be doing. And he got an email. He holds up his phone. He says, I just got an email from a client saying that they are leaving my firm for QuickBooks with live bookkeeping. This is not a not a teeny client. Like this one is, you know, not a huge one, but it's a not-for-profit. It's a good fee. It's a good client and it's going to hurt them. Uh, and everybody just paused for a second and took that in because this is exactly what is not supposed to be happening. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the problem is the, to partner with the pro advisors, right? And yeah. figure out how to balance that, that in between and not, and really not market to them. But right. it, when push comes to shove, small business owners paying, let's say they're paying $15 a month to an account or bookkeeper for, for a full stack bookkeeping service. It's really tempting when you see an advertisement for $199 or $499 or $399 to go tiptoe into those waters. Like, yeah. Well, and, and you can't hide it from them, right? They're, even if you say, we're not going to market to customers of pro advisors, they're going to find out about it, especially since, isn't this going live next month on their QuickBooks website? Isn't that? Yeah, I, it's, uh, th- we talked about that last week. Yes, uh, June in June, QuickBooks Live Bookkeeping will be on the QuickBooks website, like the main QuickBooks.com website. Yeah. And that's when I think you're going to see a big ripple from this because I, I I still argue, me and you, weekly in the closet, you know, talking about this, um, you know, our listeners, right, our growing listener base, and then you take so a lot of the active Facebook groups, you're probably only talking about 5,000 people that are aware that QuickBooks Live exists yet. Yeah, definitely, and, definitely not more than 10,000, I would say. Yeah. And so now what happens when the other 80,000 pro advisors discover this and 2 million small businesses know it exists? It's going to be fun. Yeah. June should be kind of interesting. So um, I haven't, in- oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, speaking of Michael Lee, he forwarded us a story about his home state, Vermont. The Vermont House voted 124 to 14 on Thursday evening for legislation that would boost clean water funding by 7.7 million. And the way it would do that is by taxing pre-written software accessed over the internet. It's a cloud tax. And so they're 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 you you're using the um Wayfair versus South Dakota case for e-commerce sales and basically hey, we have to go ahead, that's okay by the Supreme Court. We're going to slap a tax then on SaaS software that's not created here in Vermont as yep. well. And Nexus is going to be determined by where the buyer is, right? Because of that ruling. So if you are selling cloud software, pre-written software accessed over the internet to anyone in Vermont, you're going to have to collect sales tax now. And it looks like it's a 6%. It's the same as everything else uh, in Vermont or their standard sales tax rate. The argument, uh, according to Ways and Means Chair Janet Ansell, is that the state used to collect sales tax on software such as TurboTax, but and that was because Vermonters had to go to a store to buy software on a CD or DVD. When Vermonters buy software online, however, the state doesn't collect any tax. So this bill is restoring that or aiming to restore that lost revenue. So I, I think there's a game here between the states, right, and the munis- municipalities and the companies that sell things online, right? Mm-hmm. And ultimately... Amazon tried to play that game like, fine, we won't sell any, we won't ship products to Vermont. We're just not going to sell things to Vermont customers. But Amazon really didn't have a lot of pull because a Vermont customer could just go to Walmart, just go to a brick and mortar and buy what they need. Right. I think the SaaS software players could play hardball at Vermont because they could just say, fine, we won't let anybody in Vermont buy our software. <laughs> I but well, so and, and here, what, actually, what are you going to do? There's no alternatives. There's no alternatives. Okay. So this, unless you get a private VPN and bypass it or something. So actually, Vermont decided looked into doing this years ago and decided not to because at the time that would happen. Right, Vermont's too small. It doesn't have a, the leverage that a California or a Texas does. Right, but since since they you know in the last few years, I believe 19 states have implemented this sort of tax. So. Now Vermont is not alone. And if a company wanted to play hardball, like you said, that's a lot of people, a lot of residents that they're going to have to n- uh, not sell to. So I think the the pendulum has shifted and we're going to see more and more states start to tax online services. We had a referendum here in Arizona where um, it was about uh, 
putting sales tax on, ta- sales tax on services yeah. I, across the board and, and banning it forever. Like you can never change the content. They, they will not let the legislature, so this will be an amendment and the legislature can never implement a tax like this. On you services? Know, so you're paying services. So yeah. your, your daycare, your dentist, your software as a service. Like they, um, so that was a referendum item. So, I mean, I think some states, the, you know, the services lobby or, you know, enough professionals will get together and make that happen. But I think in most states, the, they're so desperate for revenue due to the uh, loss of you know re- retail revenue, like sales tax, retail sales tax, that they're going to be looking for w- ways to generate revenue. And taxing services is the most natural and easy way to do that, especially as our service economy grows and the, the other parts of our economy shrink. We are transitioning into a mostly services type economy. <laughs> so if you don't tax services, like also, I mean, I... What is the rationale for not taxing services? Why don't we tax services? And is it fair? Is it fair that we tax something that you buy at a store versus something that is delivered to you online? Or, uh, you know, the, a massage doesn't get taxed, but buying a massage chair gets taxed? I, I just think that it, as much, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a CPA. I don't like getting, I don't want my services taxed, but I, I can't really justify it other than my own self-interest. That's fair. I mean, I I don't know. I don't know what the why. Yeah, we'll see where this uh, goes next because this is not going to be. If it, this is just a, a tiptoe in the water. I think with say like Vermont, we'll see where this goes from here. If we're making predictions or taking bets right now, I would say um, buy stock in Avalara. <laughs> if you have to collect tax on your software sales in all fifty states, how are you going to do it? You're going to have to do an integration with something that does it automatically. And it's it's going to be Avalara Tax Jar. And I think, what well, you can't buy stack, stock in Tax Jar yet, right? Yeah. And there's all these uh, SaaS software apps that uh, um, Chargeify, Recurly. So there's there's apps out there that if you have a, a SaaS app, right, yeah. you're going to use these other apps to manage your billing processes. And so those those apps like that are going to have to integrate if they don't already with, you know, sales tax tracking stuff. So people, I think I have to disclose, I do not have a position in Avalara currently. Although I may execute one in the, in the future. Isn't that what they always say on all those investor blogs? All right, what else do we got? Uh, so I have some Intuit news um, right. and ADP news. So ADP and Intuit are announcing that they're uh, having a deeper cross-platform connection with a new service solution. And so I was surprised ADP, to hear this. It's like integrated now, right? Like in the in the app? Yeah, so if we go back in like history, like let's go back 20 years ago, if you were a very good QuickBooks customer, desktop and you were a very good ADP customer, right? Which is fair. You could be both, right? You paid a penalty. Every single payroll, you'd have to download a file from ADP, save it to your computer desktop, import that into QuickBooks desktop software to get your payroll data from ADP in there, right? Every single week. And, and it's prone to error, right? So, you know, when QuickBooks uh, Online came out and Intuit started like having that more open platform mindset, right? Mm-hmm. So that's when, uh, you know, uh, then uh, Zen Payroll at the time or Gusto integrated. So, you had, so even though Intuit has a billion dollar payroll division, they started letting other payroll providers get on their app store. And so ADP has their cloud-based um, product called Run. ADP Run. And yeah. ADP Run. And so that has a deep, that has an integration with QuickBooks Online. Apparently they made it better because it sounds like reading the article here, it's when you signed up, you had to call up on a phone and get somebody to map your accounts across. Yeah. <laughs> like it wasn't, it was SaaS, but there was no UI for the SaaS. I don't know. Um, well, and so they, they, so I started using like, ADP Run uh, a couple of years ago. And by that time they had, they had built it so you could map it yourself, but it was really difficult. And I think <laughs> like even I had a hard time figuring it out. So yeah, that does not surprise me. So it sounds like they they uh, improved that. Also reading this article, it sounds like they may have built an integration to QuickBooks Desktop as well, instead of just the old IAF export. Oh, so cool. They, it sounds like that from the article. I have, it's hard to tell exactly because it's a little bit more of a press release type article. Right. And then it also seems to indicate that there's some sort of something they did just for QuickBooks Pro Advisors, because uh, ADP has their own accountants. Um, dashboard mm-hmm. so you can sell the clients you want payroll for but even that i tried to watch a video i can't really tell what it is or what it isn't but it, it really i think that the takeaway in this is you're going to see more and more of this uh what do you call it um co- co- uh, co-op a petition How, co-op, what's the co-op word petition i like that word i've never co-op heard that before i'm not saying it right but it's that they're 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 competitors, but they're cooperating for the sake of the. So industry. why do you think this has happened? Do you think this is because of apps like Gusto that just make this integration so easy that ADP said, "Oh shit, we got to do this." 
I think it's maturity. Um, even paychecks integrated finally, you know. So, so after 20 years of like kind of screwing customers, I really feel like people paid a penalty for not oh, having yeah, integration. Yeah, huge pain in the ass. But they were doing it on purpose, so, right? Or you know, because uh, they were competitors. Yes, and so it's just it's a more mature view of the world, yeah. and everybody wins. I mean, ADP gets to win, QuickBooks gets to win, but ultimately the clients win. Right, you you just get smoother data workflows. I mean, in the I, you know, sorry to ruin your kumbaya moment, David, but th- oh boy, <laughs> you know me, right? Does everybody win? Somebody shared an article online, and I apologize, I can't remember who about Borders and Amazon. How like Borders in the early years of Amazon, Borders utilized Amazon as their delivery mechanism, and then they tried to compete with Amazon later, and they failed and disappeared. And this, to me, it's like ADP is now trying to cooperate and. Maybe this analogy doesn't work, but like now they're making it easy, but I still don't think it's enough. I think they're still going to be hugely disrupted and, you know, lose the small business market. Oh, I think, it, yeah. And, and I think we're, what you're saying, if I'm hearing you, it's, it's, is this too little too late? Yeah. Right. Like, and, and I, I feel like, cause I mean, I remember go, reaching out to ADP, reaching out to paychecks, these legacy payroll players before these other apps right. existed about like, Hey, like, Let's build an integration. Like you got to integrate. You got to integrate. Like customers are suffering yeah. pain from this, and it, you're right. Like, why did it take twenty years of customers paying a penalty before this yeah. finally got done? You're right. Is it too little, too late? I, that that only time is going to tell that. But yeah. So I do have a follow up on the free file fiasco since we're talking about Intuit. Okay. And this probably I probably would have led with this if Walters Kluwer hadn't screwed up so bad. Free file made the NBC nightly news. I don't know if you watch Lester Holt. Uh, David, but I I, I like wow. Lester Holt a lot. I like NBC Nightly News. Kind of just turn it on to get out of my niche and see what what is happening broadly, right in America and the world, just for half an hour or so. And on May sixth, Freefile made the NBC Nightly News. They had a segment on it, and it's because the Los Angeles City Attorney sued H and R Block and TurboTax for allegedly misleading low income taxpayers. The allegation is that the companies defrauded low-income taxpayers and charged them for a service that the companies are required by law to provide for free. The suits allege, it's two different ones against each company, the suits allege that the companies, quote, intentionally obscured and failed to disclose, unquote, differences between its commercial products and the free file program. And for our listeners who missed the last episode, free file is a free service that the IRS requires these firms to provide to anyone with an adjusted gross income of $66,000 or less. It's a deal that they cut with Intuit, H&R Block, and a number of other tax preparation companies. As part of this agreement, the IRS said, we're not going to go make our own tax software. You're going to provide it for free to these lower income Americans. Intuit and H&R Block, it has turned out, according to a ProPublica investigation, have been hiding their free file offerings and apparently, allegedly, directing these folks who should have paid nothing into paid products that charge them up to over a hundred dollars at times. So do you have a, a link to that article for the show notes or is that no, no, just on the news uh, only? there's a link on the TV that I will be putting in the show notes to an article uh, and it has the segment uh, embedded as a video. Okay. And the reason, the reason I'm bringing that up is because I feel like I saw a tweet from this guy and my question I have, I yeah. guess, if you have this access to the article right now, is this guy tr- like part of the uh, LA, uh, LA County um, uh, Attorney General's office that, that's doing this? Or does he just have a Twitter name that says, like, I'm a LA Los Angeles city lawyer? Because I feel like I saw a tweet about this and I clicked on him. I was like, I think he's just a lawyer. Like, I didn't like, like this might be more of a class action type suit oh, no, like, no, no. this is not this is Mike, government uh, foyer he is our elected elected city attorney of los angeles obviously he's also a politician and he's jumping on this as a you know way to make a name for himself and but also you know his argument okay. is his job is to represent the citizens of los angeles and a lot of la residents you know there's what over 12 million of us at this point are uh, lower income and are affected by this so millions and millions of people so um, it's kind of cool to see cloud accounting in in the NBC Nightly News. Here we are. Uh, okay, no, this is okay. So City Attorney yeah. LA is his Twitter handle. Yeah, and you said it's Mike Fuer, F E U E R. Okay, got it. So check it out. Uh, you know, let us know what you think. Is this is this ridiculous? Uh, I have seen commentary on Twitter that 
you know, hey, this is this is absurd into it, Nietzsche Block, or they're abiding by the terms of this. This is just natural marketing. Of course, they want people to use their paid products, but people should know better, right? And I think that was kind of one of the arguments that you and I were tossing around as well. Maybe people should just like, do their homework and go find the free file program. If you go find the page on the IRS website, you can get to these free programs. If you're putting it into Google, no, you won't. But, you know, that's buyer beware, right? Yeah, I think in the uh, 90s, there was that Matthew Lesko guy, the guy you'd have these TV commercials, right? Here's how you can get all this government money or these government programs, right? And he sold, the, sold that book for 40 bucks. And he's the guy who had the suits with all the question marks on it. Do you remember that guy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the, I'm sure Free File Alliance is probably in that book, along with a bunch of other government programs to get free money, right? So you're right. Like at some level, the program exists, but... Like what is the obligation of these companies to promote the program? I think that is ambiguous, and we're going to find we're going to find out what, as these lawsuits progress. But I, I think either way, you don't want to be on the the. I don't think Intuit and H and R Block really want to be on this side of the news at this point. I don't know. It's that you know, just spell the name right, get the domain <laughs> right. <laughs> like, 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 all news is good news, yeah. I guess. I mean, you think about CCH. Like CNBC would never talk about them ever, probably. Right now they're on CNBC, yep. so you know that's how, you know it gets people beyond the cloud accounting podcast exposure. I guess uh, I have a couple articles that are kind of tied together. Let's hear it. Um, so I, I want to try to get to these last week, but we just ran so long last week, so we didn't get to this. Um, but I'm glad because this week I have an article that adds on to these that kind of um, ties it together a little bit. Okay. So last two weeks ago was a Countex in London, and there was a big explosion because there was a panel of, I think there was eight weight guys on it. People were up in arms about mantles, right? So like a, a typical panel? <laughs> a typical <laughs> panel. Accounting uh, conference. Okay, sorry, yes. The, the t- it was a typical <laughs> panel at an accounting conference, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, and we've talked about this before, uh, you know, at the, uh, when we go to the ASCP events. The, we talked the, about it the, at the accounting salon. This, yeah, we uh, talked about it again at the accounting uh, Just salon. a few days ago, yeah. Yeah, and so there's a couple articles we'll get in the link. So, um, A, there's a link to the, uh, we'll have a link to the actual, um, uh, talk. The funny thing about it was the talk was about accounting trends in the landscape. You know, what's working and where are we going? Right. Mm-hmm. And so like, it's like, well, you better talk about diversity on that panel because obviously you missed that, that boat. Um, Heather Townsend wrote a very good article um, and blog post about are all white male panels hindering diversity in accounting. Mm-hmm. And so I think she has a really good post. Paul um, Mesner on Twitter. So Paul Mesner, I don't know if you know who he is. He hosts uh, From the Trenches. It's um, an accounting podcast uh, in Australia. Yeah, you shouldn't listen you shouldn't to it, listen though. To you it. should always listen no. to the cloud. <laughs> but he, he went off on like a nice um, eight Twitter uh, rant about this. And I think it's really valuable. So we'll have a link to his tweets about that. But let's bring it into this week. So I did discover an article yeah. on going concern that ties into all of this. How new accounting grads, because everybody's graduation week, right? This week, yeah. can tune up their diversity BS detectors. And this uh, article is written by Joanne Cleaver. And essentially, she's giving you a manual of how to like see through the crap that's on people's websites. So one thing she talks about is to summarize is like most of them will list best places to work, mm-hmm. right? But that's just like blather about what benefits they have, amenities, but not really, there's no, when they make those lists of best places to work, they never take into account uh, how they um, have a diverse staff or retain a diverse staff or promote a diverse right. staff. Like it's not part of that criteria. So she actually has concrete things you can do. So if you're a new grad and you're looking to go get a job in the accounting industry, you can go to these companies' websites you're possibly interviewing with or going to take a job with, and you can figure out if they support diversity. And so the first thing she says is you can actually just count their names or faces. Right. So she says you can just go to their website. A lot of Look them at the pictures. List their pictures of their partners. And she just did start counting. And she made a little joke. She's like, don't worry, you won't run out of fingers. Like you just start well, and, touching their noses. And, yeah. And by the way, if the, if the accounting firm doesn't have pictures of the partners on their website, don't work there. Like that. <laughs> Because <laughs> like everybody should have pictures of the partners on their website at this point. If they don't, they don't know what they're doing from a marketing perspective anyway. Side note, go ahead. Side note. And then um, look at the uh, firm's leadership pipeline. So a lot of them will have a news section on the site and they'll talk about their, their latest partner class uh-huh. right? and look at those every single year. And if you don't see diversity in the partner class, or, or really, at this point, you should see being an increasing proportion of women and minorities over the time. If mm-hmm. you don't see that, 
it's not happening. And then see if women are setting up their new practices, because ultimately it matters. If, and I'll read her quote. Um, Why does this matter? Because running an office or a practice is a microcosm of running a whole firm. That's how partners qualify eventually to be the big dog, to, to be the top dog. And ultimately, she uh, she argues like if the accounting profession profession won't have more women and minorities running firms, if women and minorities don't get a chance to show they can make money in a smaller scale. And so, so it's a good article that's just a, a manual of so hey, do these three things, and it'll tell you a lot about a firm. Was it on the from the trenches podcast where I can't remember uh, who said it, but the idea was hey. The reason that so many men attend these panels is because it's easier for them to step away from family commitments. And a lot of the stuff isn't paid anyway. And if you make it paid, right, then you're more likely to get more women and minorities, especially since they're on, they tend to be in smaller firms at this point, right? Because the diversity, the diversity is better in smaller firms than in large firms, right? And large firms, though, are the ones that have the resources to send somebody. Yeah, I mean, there's a challenge, right? Because a smaller firm, you don't have the elbow room. Yeah, I think those are possibilities. Yeah. But I also feel like, in, in based on my experience of putting on panels at conferences, right? I always felt like you have to represent the audience that's at the conference, right? And, and, right. and arguably, like, I've been to enough accounting conferences to know that it's not just all white males attending the conferences. Now, yes, on well, stage, you'll see, you'll think it's that. But if you really step back and look at the audience, it's not. And I always yeah. felt like I've tried to make sure any panels I put together are representative of the audience that's attending. Yeah. Um, and I actually feel like if you're just 10% conscious about this, it makes 200% difference. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, like it you does just have to be a little bit conscious about it. Um, but I did hear and, and I think somebody said this at the accounting salon that the either somebody else said it or it was a accounting salon member. I don't know if you remember, they talked about like they've had a policy for a couple of years now where if they look at a conference panel, and they don't think it's diverse. They just opt out and won't participate in the conference panel. Yes, that is. That's the thing is the participants. If the participants in the panel ask who else is on the panel and there, there isn't enough diversity the, and the participants speak up, that is probably the thing that will change it the fastest. If we just say no. Yeah. Well, well also when you put together a panel, right? I mean, you, 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 you have, you run marketing, you're, you're going to probably be putting together a panel here or not. It's frustrating because I feel like it's so, it's so easy not to do this and people just do it. I, I, I it's, it, it kind of makes my, um, I'm just going the air and just. Well, it's hard enough. It's hard enough to. I mean, the argument is it's hard enough to get people to be on your panel in the first place, but that shouldn't be an excuse. I, right? I think We're that is trying. all. Like, like I, I saw, I saw defenses of this, right? Like, oh, women don't apply, or women don't try to be on panels, or you know, it's all baloney. I, I put together lots of panels. I've never had anybody say no, unless they were like, like physically, like, oh, I already booked a family vacation. I'm not even going to that conference, right? Like, like, I've never had anybody say no, so I don't know if I buy into that. Um, maybe they say no because they don't like your conference or your panel <laughs> or you. I don't know. But I've never had anybody not say yes to when they're asked. Anything else in the news? Well, we were talking about taxes, and I've had this one sitting on my list for a long time. And I want to hit it before we, we go because this is controversial. And, you know, I like controversial, right? Okay. So this is an article from last month, two days before tax day on April 13th in the New York Times, everybody's favorite semi-socialist publication. Just, I'm just totally sarcasm there. I'm kidding. Okay. I love the New York Times. I read it and the Washington and, and the uh, Wall Street Journal. You're just trying to be funny to earn that, that, that five-star to be funny. review. It's not working. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the headline is, everyone's income taxes should be public. Disclosure of tax payments would make it easier to hold politicians accountable. It would help to reduce fraud and economic inequality. And he makes the argument that in 1924, I did not know this, the United States passed a law that made all income tax returns public. So you could go and you could read anyone's income tax return. It was obviously not popular with the folks who made a lot of money. Uh, And the act was rescinded not long afterward, but there is precedent for us doing this. And uh, Mr. Applebaum uh, argues that we should revisit that. Uh, the argument is that it would reduce tax fraud. I guess, you know, more transparency leads to greater yeah, this is more honesty. 
It's never happened. Because like, uh, it, it, well, that means says, every politician is going to have to share their – they're going to have to share their tax returns. This is never, 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 never happening. Also, ever. you and me, David, everyone. So uh, – and there is actually a country that does this now. A few of them do this. In Norway, tax records have been public since the founding of the modern state in 1814. And a newspaper put the records online in 2001. One study estimated that the record's greater avail- availability caused a 3.1% increase in the reported incomes of self-employed Norwegians over the next three years, perhaps because they feared exposure. In Finland, tax data is published every year on November 1st. It is jovially known as National Jealousy Day, and people treat that information as a barometer of whether inequality is yawning too wide. I agree with you. This is never going to happen. I find it interesting I, that, that some countries do make tax return information public. I think this could be one of those unintended consequences things, right? People will start uh, utilizing tax shelters and hiding money, and they'll be doing other stuff even more. Like it'll cause even more inequality and more lying. Because they won't want that stuff to show up on their tax return? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Because I right did. now, drug dealers file tax returns. Right? <laughs> other, and, and, and people doing illegal activities, they pay their taxes. A lot of them do. Right. And this, the people would possibly not want to make this information public. Yeah. And they'll do more to hide it. Like, I think this is one of those unintended consequences things. It would ripple really bad. Well, I mean, we're not even comfortable in our businesses you know, sharing, their, sharing how much people make. No, people don't want to talk about their salaries. Right. We discourage it as employers because we don't want people using that information to negotiate. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. And, but I just think it was interesting that somebody made that argument and that we actually did do that at one point. And actually, uh, at the bottom of the article, another thing I didn't know, apparently when the first income tax was passed in 1861 during the Civil War, that also had full disclosure. Uh, there was disclosure of names, incomes, and tax payments. And then over the following decade uh, before that, first income tax was ended, that data was posted in public and printed in newspapers. So it's been done before, might happen again. So, uh, you know, get ready, guys. My only argument uh, for making it public is that there's people that built that, people that have access to the data, right? As, as these tech companies get bigger and bigger and you have the Equifaxes of the world, right? And obviously the IRS has some of this data, but a lot of this data is already out there. Oh, yeah. It's kind of public already. Oh, the vast majority you mean, of your data you mean, so like you. TurboTax files taxes for millions and millions of Americans. They have this information and they're benefiting yeah. from it. Yeah, but as far as, yeah, I mean, but it's not, I don't necessarily think like Intuit is utilizing that in the same way, right? But like think about your credit report, right? Like people can sign up and buy a credit report and the second you apply for a mortgage, they get a notification that you apply for a mortgage, you get 10 other phone calls from other mortgage companies instantly. Well, you know who right? is using this information to benefit is uh, Credit Karma. Right? They have a free tax product that you don't pay mm-hmm. anything for, but in exchange for doing your taxes for free, they get to mine that information and market to you. Yeah. So like that's that's the future, right? Eventually, I think all tax preparation will ultimately be free. It's just going to be a question of, do you want to pay or do you want to give your information to somebody so they can mine it? I don't know. Yeah. So okay, so ultimately, the way to think about this is is maybe it's already public. It's just public in a a poor way where you can't, you and I can't uh. get access to it, but people in the know can. Huh. Well, uh, that's all I got for this week. If folks want to get in touch with us online, David, tell us what they think, offer their commentary on Walter's Kluwer or Free File or QuickBooks Live or whether or not everyone's income taxes should be public. Where can they reach you, David? I'm on Twitter. Very easy to find at David Leary. I am also on Twitter. I am at Blake T. Oliver. And find and like our Facebook page, Cloud Accounting Podcast. Type that into your Facebook and you'll find us. Or the Twitters. Yeah, or the Twitters. Uh, We've got a a Cloud Accounting Podcast account on Twitter. But most importantly, if you listen to anything that I just said, go to cloudaccountingpodcast.com and click on the subscribe banner to join our email list. That way you'll get the show notes sent out to you automatically the day after, the morning after I publish an episode. And you'll have a summary of the episode along with links to all the articles that we discussed. You can follow up on everything we talked about. And uh, do us a favor and write a review on iTunes. We will read it on the air. So you want to express your opinion? You want to tell us what you think about the show? Uh, We will read it. We're we're just asking for it. uh, That was was too much probably, but go easy on us, guys. Come on. And then uh, (laughs) and some of you that, uh, you know, are still anti-cloud and you want to listen to something, the cloud 
cloud desktop podcast is out there. No, you, the desktop. Cloud desktop account. No. No, uh, start again. You do it. You say this. <laughs> and if you want to listen to another podcast other than From the Trenches, check out the Desktop Accounting Podcast for all the latest desktop accounting updates, including Quicken and uh, QuickBooks Desktop. And I think Sage, they talk about as well. Sage as well. Sage 50. Yep. Excellent. Really, uh, really fantastic journalism. And we look forward to more episodes of the Desktop Accounting Podcast. But I think they have to send you that on CD-ROM, though. Yeah, I think it's uh, you got to put in your address and then pay a fee. I think you have to send them a check in the mail, and then they will uh, mail you a CD with the ep- with the with the podcast on it. Yes, good times. All right, everybody, I think that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Talk to you next week, David. All right, bye. Bye.